All right, you guys, I want you to think for a second. What type of man of God or woman of God do you want to be? Now, I don't know. Do me a favor. Raise your hand if you've ever, like, even just thought about that. So, and, and no worries if you haven't. I, I don't know how often people think about stuff like that. Like, this is the type of man, Christian, I want to be, woman, Christian, I want to be. This is, these are the people I look up to, right? Can you think of even qualities that you want to, you really want to exemplify or people that you want to model and imitate? I, I want to take some answers. What are, when you think of the person you want to be, the, the man or woman of faith you want to be, what are some of the qualities that come to mind? Yeah. Well-spoken, and intelligent. intelligent. Shout them out. All right, say it again. Brave. 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 Okay. Porphy? Disciplined. Disciplined. I had one over here. Reliable. Reliable. I like that. Passionate. Passionate. Obedient. Obedient. Cool. Caring. Caring. And one more over here. What was that? Constant. Constant. I like that. That's one of mine. Uh, The words that come to mind for me are um, consistent and humble, Uh, and there was another one that I've written down somewhere here, and I I can't remember you until it means a lot, Um, but what are people that you look up to? People that you think, man, I want to model my faith after this person, or I want to do something like that person. For me, I think of people like Spurgeon. Uh, I think of people like Piper or one of the Hoffmans. Uh, Corey Ten Boom or Elizabeth Elliot. I've been, my wife's been reading books about her and telling me tons of stuff. Sam, who'd you have in mind? Jesus. Jesus. Not, never a bad answer. Yeah. Watchman Nee. Watchman I'm reading his, one of his books right now. Anyone else? Yeah. Keith Green. Keith Green. I like it. Yeah. John Bunyan. John Bunyan. Yeah, excellent. If you guys haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, yeah. Dude, I, I hope so. Hey, here, um, for a long, long, long time, one of my favorite verses and a verse that I've tried to live by is 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I really, 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 really want to be that type of person. I truly do. I want, and when I think about the way God is moving right now, and, and again, if you've been around for a few weeks, you know there's, there's some fun stuff happening. And it makes me think about these things more because I want to be the type of man that when God moves, I respond well to it. I want to be the type of man that when he moves, I could discern how he's moving. And, and I, part of me, like, I do not want to be someone who misses it because I, I'm, I'm prideful like the Pharisees, or I miss it because I'm, I'm stuck in some other idolatry. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the type of person who tries to take it and, and use it for my own, my own profit or anything like that. So I, I think about these men and women who have been used by God in powerful seasons and, and powerful times, and I, I think, how did they get there? What did they do? And the truth is, something that a lot of these people share in common is that they endured great adversity. They went through significant trials. And, and when I hear that, I think, great, <laughs> Right? That's not something that I'm like itching for, but at the same time, I'm also like, Lord, what is that going to look like in my life? I don't know if you've ever had this thought, but I've often thought, I see that the, the people who have moved in powerful ways often are ones that have trusted you and faithfully responded well through times of difficulty. And I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. It brought me to this verse uh, in, in Luke. And it says, this is Jesus talking at the Last Supper. And he says, you, he's talking to the disciples, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat 
and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That is pretty dang rad. He's talking to these disciples and he says, I've been through a lot and you guys have stood through it all with me. And I see that and I recognize that and you're going to be rewarded for that. But then he goes on and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And this you here is plural. So, so the disciples are sitting there and he turns to Simon, but he's saying, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to, shift, to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. You, that you have denied three times that you know me. You see here in verse 33, Peter saying, pretty dang quickly. I don't know, Jesus. I won't do it. I won't fall. And, and Peter's known for having these bold statements of faith. Jesus is walking on water, and he's the one who calls out, Jesus, if that's you, command me that I walk out to you. Right? Peter is attributed be, with being one of the first people that recognize Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And, and so, and this though, this is a bold statement. No, Jesus, I'm going to go wherever you go. I'll go to prison. I'll go to death, but I'm not going to fall. That's what he's saying here. But where is that coming from? Because it seems like when, when Jesus, it, it seems Jesus wasn't saying, hey, I want to reward you this way, but only if you can endure this. I'm going to reward you, but you're going to stumble because you're going to fail. It doesn't seem like anything like that. It seems like Jesus was telling him, hey, look, I want to give you a compassionate warning. And I want to tell you that I'm praying for you because this is going to happen. This is something that you are going to have to work through. But I'm praying for you. This is something that needs to happen. Because what I want you to do and what I want you to accomplish necessitates it. You know, we, we should have some bold prayers. I want you to have bold prayers in your life. I want you to think about things that you want to accomplish for the kingdom of God. And, and that's going to look a little bit different for each and every one of us, depending on what gifts and talents. Like for me, I want to do things that would make sense for a pastor to do, right? And some of you want to start businesses, want to be innovators. Um, one of my wife's like deepest desires is a, about our kids and just being a really good mom that raises them up in a way that honors the Lord. One of my big prayers is that my four children will honor the Lord all of their life. That's a for a lot of us, we didn't grow up in a Christian home. So that's a big, bold, difficult prayer. Because we have to figure out what that looks like. And we have to go look for people to model that. And, and there are many different ways that you can pray big prayers, bold prayers, saying, God, I want to see you move in my life through this way or in this way. But as we make those prayers, it's also important to understand that to get there, is, is not easy. We don't want to make these prayers and then get disillusioned because we thought, oh, there will be trials, but, I mean, not really. Or we think, I, I can endure whatever comes against me, and, and we just don't think there will be any trials. You know, Peter here, he said, I'm ready to go with you wherever, to prison and to death. And it's interesting, a few hours later after this, Jesus gets arrested. And we, we read in the story that, that Peter had his sword on him in the prayer meeting when they went to the garden. And, and he, Jesus gets arrested and goes walking off, and Peter's like, it's go time. I'm going to prove to God that I will do whatever it takes. And he busts out his sword and chops off the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. And Jesus is like, stop. 
this is not the battle that I have for you. This is not the way I want it to look. The real trial wasn't that. The real trial came just a little bit after that when, when Peter denied Jesus. Jesus is saying to Peter here, and he says to us, to get you where I want to get you so that you can do the things I want you to do. You need to be tested. And I'm going to allow you to be tested. You see, everything of value goes through testing. You think about diamonds, and it takes pressure and a lot of time. Gold, it takes heat and refinement. I think about products that we wear. A lot of the, the major athletic companies, they put all their, uh, their new clothes and their new product, they put it through testing, and they have people that they specifically hired to go try it out and to give them feedback. You know, a few years back, someone found a, an iPhone that was one of the, like, pre-release. It wasn't released yet, but one of the, like, Apple employees had it and was testing it, was using it. And, and all of these things are tested, and it's what brings them value. It's what gets them to a place with this is a decent product. I think it's a pretty dang good product because it's gone through a lot of different tests and trials, not only before we got it, but then each time they're trying to renew it. Relationships are like that. Have you ever been through a lot with someone? I bet you're close. Or at least I, I bet you know a lot about them. Maybe it's that very thing that made you not close. Marriage is like this. We make these big, bold statements. Man, I'm going to be with this person for the rest of my life. But if what we think that means is we're never going to endure trials, we're wrong. And that's where so many people get mixed up because one of the purposes of marriage is to refine us and to transform us. And we could often approach it like it's just for my joy. But the marriages that allow refining, that allow the tests to make them stronger, are the marriages that we look up to. Because through the test, there's strength. So when it comes to our spiritual walks with God, God allows us to be tested. Because he wants to use us to accomplish something bigger and greater and different than we can accomplish on our own or that we can accomplish simply without testing. You know, First Peter puts it this way. Oh, first, we'll read this James verse. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, God's saying, I want you to consider it joy when you go through these trials. Now, now that doesn't mean that you have to be happy in every aspect of every trial. That's not what it means. But even as you're enduring something difficult, maybe painful, what James is saying here is I want you to understand that even the very most difficult thing you've ever faced, God can use in your life to bring about a result that not only are you going to look more like Jesus, not only will you know how to rely more on Jesus, but others will see you and they will see a greater picture of Jesus. That changes a bit how we face some of these trials. First Peter puts it this way. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Or the, another translation says you, you have to suffer through various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the re revelation of Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus singled Peter out. It's kind of weird. All of them were going to be tested. All of them were being asked to have permission, but he calls out Peter. And he does it because Peter played a special role among those 12. God said, hey, I want you 
to be the leader of my church, the beginning of my church. So I'm going to call you out and let you know you're going to go through trials. And I'm not calling you out because, man, you're, you're a big mess up. I'm not calling you out because you've done anything wrong. In fact, these trials are proof that I care and love about you. And I want to use you for something big. It's not unique to Peter. Abraham did this. Right? God promised him, promised him an heir. And then in Genesis 22, we read that God called Abraham and said, hey, I want you to go sacrifice your son to me. We, we learn later. He, he would, never would have let that happen. He wanted to test Abraham's faith. It was a test. In Genesis 22, 16, it says this. By myself, this is God speaking to Abraham. I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. God says, man, this test has shown that I can trust you in everything. Right here in Deuteronomy, Moses here is talking to the Israelites who had wandered. And it says, you shall remember all the ways which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And then here's Jesus, right at the beginning of his ministry, it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, and God's not doing the tempting. I'll get to that in a minute. But but the Spirit's leading because there's something big going on here in all of these things. God's saying, Abraham, I want to use you to start an entire nation, to be the father of that nation. So in order for me to use you in that way, I need to test you. Israelites, I want to I use you to found that, establish that nation in the promised land and to defeat all these enemies. And in order for you to do that, I'm going to test you. Jesus, you have the greatest task ever given to anyone. God tests those whom he loves and wants to use. That's us. God want, God's going to test us. And again, I, I'm not going to spend as much time on this as it probably deserves, but not all tests are, I'm mean, sorry, not all trials, not all tests are from God. Right? James says that God cannot tempt us to sin. Now, before that, in the same passage, James says that God will test you. And then he says, but he will not tempt you to sin. And, and it's the same word used in both of those, tempt and temptation, and te I'm sorry, test and tempt, which is kind of weird. But it's not like he's using two different, he's using the same word and he forgot about it. And, you know, he's writing a new letter 10 years later and he, he accidentally does that. He knows exactly what he's doing because he's trying to make a point. There's a difference there. And so what trials you have endured in your past what trials you're enduring now, I cannot tell you without sitting down, and even then I'm not, I, I can't guarantee, I know, whether that is God or whether that is Satan. There are tests and challenges that we face that are directly from the enemy. Who, who, it's spiritual attack. And again, if it's causing you to sin, God will not tempt us and cause us to sin in that way. And so there's there's this fine line where sometimes God says, I'm just going to back up and let Satan tempt you and see what you do. And other times God directly tests us, as it says in, in a few different places. But here's what I want to get at. Every single one of those, from the minor and small, man, I was tempted this morning to look at something and I knew I shouldn't and I, whatever, all the way to the really big and heavy trial that you go through when you, you lose something big. Every single one of those is an opportunity we have to go to God. And if we do that, that refining, that us going before God and that leaning into His strength and not relying on ours, 
is an opportunity for us to become more like him. And it puts us in a position where we will be able to be used by him for something, something else, which is either we could be a witness to someone else struggling through that, or it's, it will lead to promotion, which leads to greater opportunities to be his witness. Every single opportunity can be used by God if we allow him to move in it. You see, God tests those whom he loves and he wants to use. And he tested Abraham and the Hebrews and David and Jesus, and he tested all of them because he wanted to use them. And he's doing that and allowing that for us as well. And in this season that we're in with everything going on, my prayer is this, God, I want to know and recognize these tests and these trials, and I want to bring them to you. Father, and I want you to use whatever it is in my life to, to refine me and to make me a greater vessel for the purposes you have for me. You see, you cannot separate the purpose God has for you from testing. Now, you, you can... I want to be clear here. That doesn't mean all tests you can't get out of. I per, currently... I'm not struggling with like crazy temptation to, to steal from grocery stores. I'm not, I don't have currently a, a big drug addiction, right? There are, there are tests and, and struggles that thankfully I, I don't have. So I'm not saying you can't avoid all tests, and, uh, but you can't, uh, how, how do I phrase this? There are specific things that clearly we are called to avoid. Jesus says, flee from this sin. Run away from this. But in general, when it comes to all testing, you can't say, I'm, no, I'm just going to step back and I, there's going to be no tests, no challenges, no trials. That's not how it works. And honestly, that's not how we want it to work. Because if you look at your life and if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, then you'll also see in the times when you were the most desperate and the most challenged were times when the Lord met you in new and powerful and unique ways that I pray you, you're holding on to. And some of you are like, I don't know that that's my experience. Some of you are thinking, no, I, I've gone through some, some stuff, some junk. And right now you're trying to figure out where was the Lord in all of that? And I want to I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to bring that to God. And maybe even sit with me or sit with the leader and say, hey, help me see where God was in this because even now God can bring healing and bring strength through it. So how do we, how do we prepare? What do we do if God says, hey, I'm, not, I'm going to bring tests and I want to bring tests because I love you and I want to use you for something bigger than you that you could do alone. How do we prepare? What do, what do we do from here? Uh, I'm going to skip this. I want to... We got to look at the small tests in front of us now and see them as preparation for the bigger tests that are coming. The, the cliche example of this is, is, of course, David. We talk about this where, where he had these small tests before him. There's this thing in, um, do I have any lifeguards in here? Anyone that's ever been a lifeguard? Just one? I have two brothers that are, are lifeguards. Uh, Nena, were you ever red shirted? Yeah. So there's this thing in lifeguarding, it's called a red shirt. And what happens is my brothers, they, would, they went through classes to become certified or whatever to be a lifeguard. Then they got hired at the YMCA. And then occasionally, the YMCA would hire someone to go into the pool and kind of pretend to drown or struggle to swim or do something that they would have to respond to as a lifeguard. And if, if they missed it, it was a big deal. You would get written up. You could get fired, and, but they never knew when it was going to happen. You didn't get a, a notice, hey, red shirt's coming today. It was just any day, at any time, someone could be there, paid, to see, to test you, to see if you were ready. And, 
And so how do you prepare for that? What do you do? Well, as a lifeguard, you just always need to be watching. And that, that seems pretty like, yeah, duh, of course, but lifeguards, you spend most of your time yelling at kids for not running. Uh, it's mostly like kids don't drown every day. It's not like you're doing CPR all the time. Like it's just, it's easy to get distracted or complacent or whatever. So in order to be on guard at all times, lifeguards have to be on guard at all times. They have to be watching. They have to be paying attention. And that's how we are ready for a lot of these small things is we don't get complacent. We don't lose track of what we're doing or what, why we're doing it. You know, the, the way to be ready for a red shirt is to always watch in case someone is drowning. Uh, and the way to be ready in life for tests and challenges is just to know there are tests and challenges that are always going to be coming up. And when you start, you enter into a relationship, that's an opportunity right there. That's going to be a test. That's going to be a challenge. How far are you going to go? How, what's going to dictate your relationship? Who, what, like, what are the, the lines there? When you get a promotion or you get a paycheck or you, you get cut off or you, I mean, every opportunity is one that we can glorify God in or we can do something else, right? We, we can cuss someone out or we can choose otherwise or we can do whatever. So the way that you prepare for big challenges is you, you say, God, in this small one, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to look for you, and, and how do you want me to, to operate? And let me say this. It's not a fearful thing. Like, lifeguards don't show up, and they're like, oh, man, I might get red-shirted today. No. It's just you just do your, your job. And as you do that, you're going to get more and more confident as you are diligent about it that you can handle more and more. But as we do that, we're building up strength for the next test. You know, today's victories give us confidence for tomorrow's trials. You know, Abraham was told, hey, I, God said in Genesis 22, go sacrifice your son, your only son. And, and we think that was the trial, but he had 25 years of waiting on God to provide that son. And that 25 years of trusting God, and then he, he messed up a little bit in that, learned some lessons, and then eventually he got his son. All of that was preparation. All of that was his, him relying on the Lord, leaning on the Lord. The Israelites' 40 years in wilderness taught them to rely on God. When you rely on God every morning for manna, it changes the, your relationship with God. And here's the catch with this. We're not being confident in ourselves. If you have a trial or a challenge that comes into your life and you, you leave that trial thinking, man, I am better prepared. I can do this on my own. God's going to send you another challenge. Like, you're going to be humbled. That's not how it works. But we've all been through trials where we think, God, I really need you. I need you to, to lead me through this. I need you to lead me out of this. I need you to give me the strength to endure this, whatever it is. Where we go, God, I need you. That's the type of trial that we remember the next time another challenge comes up. I'm almost done. Let me wrap up. Here's, here's the catch. With these men of faith, women of faith that I look up to, and I think, I want to have a faith and an impact like them, rarely was their, their big trial, their big challenge, something that, that could have been predicted. You know, Peter thought he knew what the trial would be, but it ended up being pretty different. He was ready to throw down for Jesus. And it, it, he, something else was required. Spurgeon, when he first started preaching, one of the first events he went to, or um, big uh, opportunities to, to bring a message, a stage collapsed and a bunch of people died. That's how he started his career. That's heavy. That's hard. Neil Hoffman never expected what would happen to him when Ryden was born and, and all the complications that came from that. 
Mark and Dave have two different illnesses, both very different, both unexpected. So how do you prepare for what you, you can't see coming? Those little trials strengthen you for the big ones. But even in the big ones, we always have to have a, a perspective that we're working for something and we're working to get through this trial for, for something bigger than us. I think about my friend Drew Miles, who uh, just adopted uh, a son. It took him 1,307 days to work through the process. And you think about something like that, where he's like, God, I want to serve you. I want to foster a kid. Ends up being, we're going to adopt this kid. And then all of the trials... It, all the battles, and I'm not even going to get into it, but it was hard. There were things, steps he had to go through and uh, hoops he had to jump through and then accusations he had to defend himself for and, and just everything, 1,307 days. But throughout that, he was, he was reminded that he is working to give this boy, Dylan, a better life. And we, whatever we're going through, whatever trial we're facing, the Lord says, I want to see you through it. Not only because I want to strengthen you and show that, that I can do that, not only because uh, I have good works for you to accomplish when you get to the other side and, and you're going to be strengthened to accomplish those things, not only because it's going to testify and other people will look at you and recognize that, man, the Lord is working in you. But even big picture, it might even be bigger than all of that. Peter's trial and all of that is something that we're, we're looking at and is a model for us today. Job's trial is something that we can look to and find strength in. I'll skip a few verses, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one. It says, James, in James 1.12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want to say one last thing, and that's we're, we're never alone in our trials. We started in Luke 22, and, and Jesus says, hey, I have something really, really cool for you disciples. But before you get to that, you're going to be sifted. You're going to go through these trials. But even after he says that, he says, but I have prayed for you. And this is what Peter missed. Peter heard trial and temptation, or trial and tests, and he thought, uh uh. But he missed this. Jesus said, But Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail you, may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Here's what we know about God He is faithful faithful and just to complete the work that he began in you. We know that his promises are true and he says he will never leave you or forsake you. You know, Jesus endured the greatest trial and he did that and what he was doing it for was a whole lot of people that would deny him and turn their backs on him and fail him. Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we get to work through trials and tests, but who we're doing it for is some, someone very different. We get to do it in response to Jesus. His trial was for us when we were not walking the way we should. And our trial is for him who loved us despite it. And says, I will strengthen you through it. 
and I will use you from, and, and strengthen you from it for those purposes. In my life, I really want to be used by God. And I'm doing everything I can to get, take the pride out of that. Like, and I know I'm, I'm human and I'm flesh, but I, I know this. I got one life to live. And it's like, I'm, I'm 34. It's flying by. I got one life to live. And I have something that the Lord has given me, this opportunity. I know him by his grace, by his goodness. And I, I've been given an ability to be used by him. And I just want to say, God, use me. Let me be a vessel. Let, let Whatever you want to do. And, and I know that even as I pray that, it's going to mean that I'm going to endure stuff I don't actually want to endure. And if your prayer is the same, then you're also going to go through stuff you're not going to want to go through. And I wanted to bring this word tonight because I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you to think that the trial you're facing is because the Lord has turned his back on you. Because that's not true. Whatever you face, whatever you go through, the Lord wants to walk through it with you and wants to use it for his glory. And we, our job is to say, all right, Lord, I trust you. I lean into you. See me through. Show me. Will you guys bow your heads? Lord, I want to pray first for, first for this community, this ministry. And we pray, Lord, would you use us? May we be your vessels. And Father, just like a, a clay vessel has to go through fire to be useful, Father, we understand that in order for us to understand endurance and, and learn perseverance and walk in the hope which will not fail, we also are going to need to be tested. So, Father, may you strengthen us for that. And those of us who have been tested already to a point where we feel like we, we broke, Father, I pray that you would reveal to us tonight where you were in that situation and, and where you are now and how you want to work through that with us. And God, may we be a people that trust you. And if you call us to suffer so that we can be a witness to, to someone else, or if you call us to go through hardship so that we can be strengthened for something else, Lord, help our prayer be, Lord, your will be done. And may we always look to your Son as our example. Thank you, Jesus.